Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everybody. How are you? All right, good. I'm glad to hear it. This is the best place I've had to speak to people uh, in this whole campaign so far and maybe throughout. So I'm delighted to be here. And I know that you have plenty of questions and comments. I look forward to that. A friend of mine who's a teacher says a lecture is a long answer to a question nobody asked. Uh, and so uh, I want to, because I learned on the campaign trail also from what you're concerned about uh, and what you care about and what you think our next governor should do. So I'm running for governor because I think that the next governor of Massachusetts has a great opportunity at a critical time to make sure that we continue to turn this economy around for everybody, not just for people at the top, but for everybody. Secondly, I think it's really important that we modernize our education, that we understand that we don't have to let our kids out in time for the spring planting and bring them back after the fall harvest. Um, and third, I think, uh, that as we have done so well in Massachusetts in providing for good quality health care that we try to afford, and we're still working on that, that we also need to provide for access and quality behavioral health care for everybody in this state. It's too important an issue. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about those three things, but I just want to thank you for being here tonight. I know there are things that you could be doing, maybe you should be doing, other than than being here, but I know you care about fairness and equality uh, and opportunity for all. And it's some of the reasons that I took on the battles that we did in the Attorney General's office. Um, in challenging Wall Street uh, and suing them and winning to make sure that we would bring money back to the state to keep people in their homes. We've kept over 30,000 people uh, in their homes. We've tried to prevent and are, as we speak, preventing unnecessary foreclosures we brought back $600 million into the state. And those numbers are good, I think, but the reason we do it are for people like Kate Reynolds. Kate and her husband lived in uh, Essex County. Kate was a teacher. Uh, her husband, Eddie, was an arborist. And they were doing fine. They owned a home. They had two kids. Uh, Eddie fell out of a tree and was paralyzed from the waist down, lost his job, his income, uh, as well as uh, they had extraordinary medical expenses. House loses value, and for 18 months, Kate tried with Wells Fargo to modify the loan uh, to try and do something so she wouldn't lose her house. Um, she finally gave up when one time she's on the phone and the person on the other end of the line said, well, we don't have a copy of your loan subrogation agreement. And Kate says, I don't know what that is. And the Wells Fargo person says, well, I don't know what it is either. Uh, and kind of highlighted the bureaucratic nightmare that so many people about to lose their homes, losing their homes, and the stress that they encountered, uh, just not fair. And so uh, we fought it, we're still fighting it, and if you saw even yesterday, we're working with New York and a few other states to make sure J.P. Morgan Chase and that settlement uh, gives Massachusetts another $34 million that'll go to homeowners and to the state and to uh, investors because of their securitization of loans. Um, fighting DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. You all know that Massachusetts in 2004 said people should be allowed to marry who they love. Uh, we all thought that worked pretty well. Uh, it was good for strengthening families. Uh, it was good for civil rights and for choice. And so our office was able to challenge the first and only attorney general to challenge that statute successfully in our federal court, in our circuit court of appeals. Uh, I was able to go to that Supreme Court argument. It was really satisfying to hear the justices ask questions, not just about the New York case, but about what happened here in Massachusetts, how marriage and families were strengthened, and how important it was that we allow states like ours that had enlarged civil rights to make sure that a statute like DOMA didn't interfere. And so that work continues. We sent a letter today uh, to Congress to urge them to pass ENDA, to make sure that discrimination in the workplace around the country against uh, anybody is uh, not going to happen. Uh, and we still know we have a lot of work in our schools as we've done so much work on bullying. We know that LGBT kids are more likely to be bullied, uh, are frankly more likely to be homeless. And so those issues about fairness, opportunity for all, and making sure that everybody has a chance um, are uppermost in my mind, at least as Attorney General, and more importantly, what I will do as governor. And so back to this idea that the economy should turn around for everybody. You know, the 95% of the recovery 
in the last few years that have gone to the 1% at the top doesn't seem to me to be the way we want things to work or the way that we do things in Massachusetts. And that does mean that we fight to make sure that the minimum wage is increased. Um, I want to commend the Senate President and the Senate for passing that. I am hopeful uh, that the House will take similar action. Many of you know, and I'm sure many of you have worked on the petition to get the most signatures ever in Massachusetts on a voluntary basis to put that on the ballot next fall if it's not changed by the legislature. That is a good start, but it's not enough. It's only a start on the way to living wage for people here in Massachusetts. And certainly earn sick time. People, many people in this room get it. Maybe we take it for granted. A lot of people don't. And it's important that we provide those, I think, basic necessities for people who are working hard, who deserve it. Uh, and we should make that happen in Massachusetts. It will be a priority uh, if and when I am your next governor. And so what else do we need to do? I've spent a lot of time making sure that government gets out of the way for businesses that want to grow here, that want to stay here to provide jobs. And that means keeping our health care costs down, keeping our energy costs down. But there is so much great work going on in Massachusetts around our innovation economy and the kinds of growth that Massachusetts is so lucky to have, you need an administration that will allow for that kind of uh, growth in business to succeed and to grow. The other side of that coin, of course, is to make sure that people have the education they need uh, to compete uh, in a global economy. And so uh, modernizing education, we know that having kids at a longer day and a more structured day is going to uh, do a lot of great things for most kids, whether they need to catch up or they want to excel. Early education is important. Making sure the kids have the opportunity for further education. And I had the opportunity today to be part of a program uh, where 40 or so of us went to schools all over Boston. Uh, I was an acting principal for a day. I didn't keep anybody after school. Um, but I was really impressed at the mission, the new mission school, um, that focuses on particular kids' learning abilities, small classes, a headmistress, headmistress who gets it who has created a culture of respect uh, and dignity for kids. And our ability to do this in Massachusetts, I think, uh, has to be front and center for the next governor. We can do it. We know it works. It's a question of connecting those dots. And let me tell you, we need to do this. Let me, let me ask, who can tell me what's the least popular advanced placement exam in Massachusetts? <laughs> Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody have kids in high school? That it's history. Oh, no. No, 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 no. It's not calculus. It's not physics either. Uh, although I went to a great physics class today. It was way over my head for most of it. Um, computer science. We had fewer than 600 kids who successfully passed the uh, advanced placement for computer science. Now, whether you're going to work for Google or Facebook or you're going to work for National Grid as a lineman, you need to know computer science and com computational ways of thinking. Uh, if you're out uh, working in, in uh, re fixing um, the electricity, you have a pole that has a computer on the top of it. If you don't understand that, you're not going to have a job. And that ties into what we need to do for all our kids so that they're prepared for a global economy, the jobs of tomorrow. We can and should do that here in Massachusetts. Uh, and we will uh, if I'm your next governor. And so in looking at the ways in which we've done so well on health care here in Massachusetts, trying to keep costs down, making sure everybody is covered here. The one thing uh, that I think we need to do better is provide for intervention and treatment for mental health. And I'll just tell you quickly, uh, I was lucky enough to grow up a family of five, but my younger brother, very smart pianist, um, uh, suffered from depression from the age 17. Uh, and I've started to talk about this more. Uh, he committed suicide when he was 33. Uh, and he and my family struggled with the stigma. Uh, the irony of this is he would say, I don't want to get treatment because it might affect my record and I won't get a job. But because he did not get treatment, he couldn't work and he couldn't maintain relationships. And after my parents died and after he had been arrested uh, for uh, vandalism, uh, he got some treatment and then uh, didn't have enough support. And, killed himself. Uh, and so I have seen, as you do, and I won't ask this, but I bet everybody in this room has a family member, a close friend, someone who suffers from mental illness. And we need to remove the stigma that we have about getting treatment and provide for coverage.
for access to that. It's as important as making sure all of our kids are physically well. We need to make sure that their behavioral and mental health is well. We can do it here too. That's also an issue that I believe because we've been able to do so much in Massachusetts, we can do here. As I mentioned and as I wind up and, and, and turn to questions and comments, you know, I was lucky enough to grow up in a family uh, out in Berkshire County. I'm from North Adams, it's why I say my R's, because I'm <laughs> closer to the New York State line. And, you know, we had four girls and my brother, and we were very lucky that my mom and dad felt it was as important for the girls to get a good education, to chart their way in life, as it was for my brother. So we had that opportunity uh, to go to college, for me to go to law school. And when I graduated from law school, my dad gave me a plaque. I still have it in my office. It says, sometimes the best man for the job is a woman. So I would like to be that woman. I'd love to be your next governor. Um, and I'd love to get your help. And I'd love to have your questions and comments tonight. And thank you for coming out. Thank you. Question and then open it up and you know maybe three-ish minutes for answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, the first question is about uh, welfare reform. It's okay. Um, the legislature and the governor, as you know, are considering reforms to the state cash assistance programs that will likely result in thousands being unable to access the assistance they need. The proposed law creates difficult burdens, such as requiring an eight-month pregnant woman to show proof an, of an ongoing job search to qualify. As many as 4,500 people will be removed from disability assistance, and immigrants will be removed from housing as part of the proposed bill. Can you talk about how you view these attempts to change welfare programs and how you would see your role as governor in standing up for low-income families? Sure. No, I appreciate the question. And I think that many of those changes, um, I'm guessing, are aimed at uh, some sense that somehow this is abused or that money has gone where it shouldn't go. Well, let me tell you where I am on this. I think that we should make every effort to make sure that people who need those benefits uh, get them. I do believe that we have to make sure that tax dollars go where they should. I don't think children should, should be hungry, that people who need that assistance sh should get it. So I think some of those efforts are going in the wrong direction. I think there are lots of things we can do to make sure that the people who need and deserve those benefits get them, but that uh, we tighten up to make sure there's no fraud or abuse. And we see those cases in our office, people uh, who aren't entitled to benefits but who try and get them, um, people who scam the system. And we've made it a point to try and close up the pieces of the system that allow for the misuse of the system. I think we can save a lot of money if we do that, but that should never ever affect people who are entitled to those benefits, who should get them. Um, that is what the state does, is make sure that uh, everybody does as well as they can and that we have a safety net for people who are still poor, who need that help. And so I haven't looked at all the particulars of the legislation, um, but I feel pretty strongly, having gone through what I've just seen with the recession caused by Wall Street, um, with corporations and corporate leaders doing pretty well right now. You know, Wall Street went up to 16,000 the other day. That doesn't seem to be fair to me. And what I've stood for as AG, and I will as governor, is making sure that people get help they need um, and that there is fairness in the way uh, we take care of those who are most vulnerable in our, in our commonwealth. Thank you. Climate talks in Poland are happening right now. We had a typhoon in the Philippines. Climate issues on everybody's uh, tip of their tongue. And last night there was a forum at Babson about the idea of introducing a carbon tax. Tomorrow, uh, Senator Barrett is going to be hosting a uh, talk about climate tax similar to what's been done in British Columbia. It will be a revenue neutral tax. It would shift the burden uh, for both corporate and individual for lower personal income and corporate taxes and increase gas taxes and fossil fuel taxes. Is this something that you could support, a local Massachusetts carbon tax, to help make behavior change, not voluntarily, but through price signals? Sure. I would want to see the, the, you know, the details of it, obviously. But one of the things that we've seen, I think, with that kind of leadership, uh, and what we've done in Massachusetts is making sure the EPA has done its job uh, to issue the regulations. We, we know that global warming affects all of the things you've talked about. Um, indeed, 
Uh, I don't know if Jamaica Plain is going to be in a floodplain or not, but uh, we see the very concrete effects of global warming on our atmosphere, uh, on our uh, shore. That was what we argued when we went to the Supreme Court, that we're losing part of Cape Cod, chunks of it every year because of this. So we assume that's uh, the problem, that we need to address it. And we have been, with California and New York, out in front on the limits on uh, uh, carbon fuels. We know the damage that they do. Um, and so I think we need to continue to push. We're not stopping it. Uh, we're not reversing the damage at the rate we need to. Uh, and there, we've had a lot of debate around where we're going with energy. Um, that's part of that debate. And I think the time uh, is here for people to recognize that we're not doing enough. We need to do more uh, or we're not going to have uh, much of Massachusetts left uh, in a very concrete way, but certainly for the whole country. Uh, but I would look at those proposals and, and make sure that we do what makes sense for setting those policies and, and stopping the damage from global warming. I was wondering if you could address the whole notion that um, we are now quite familiar over the years. And each year, we, it's reported that there are certain communities where the schools are failing and children are doing poorly. And it's not just in Suffolk County, but the same data come, um, appears for counties across the Commonwealth. But, so we've had now years of almost the same district consistently, so to speak, we fail it. And we don't seem to have very many good answers except to say, well, it's poverty, well, it's the lack of economic opportunity. What, what are the fundamental things that you think as being government we could do to begin to address these consistent pop, pop, pockets of urban failure or town failure and really change something <coughs> in the next 10 years for opportunity for well, I would turn that argument on its head that says, you know, oh, well, this is as a result of poverty or as a result of economic failure, and say that because we don't have schools that prepare our children um, for the future, for those jobs, that we will continue that cycle of poverty. And I do feel, and I, I, the, the more I look at this, and I'm excited about the discussion around the mayor of Boston, whichever candidate you supported, you know there was a good, uh, important discussion about the importance of schools and what we do. Uh, and I believe there's nothing more important for us, and not just for Boston or for New Bedford or Lawrence or Springfield, but some of our other uh, suburban or urban areas, uh, rural areas that also suffer from uh, the lack of uh, advantages and to me it is about fairness that all of our kids deserve that chance to do as well as they possibly can and when and and, and look I, I know this from uh, being a district attorney uh, if we have kids who come to school hungry or who have problems at home or who have learning disabilities they don't do well in school and you know what they drop out or they're absent and then they really don't do well and then uh, we end up with uh, a, a very difficult problem, continued poverty, uh, all of the other impacts that we've seen. So it seems pretty straightforward to me. And I believe that we are at the verge where we've seen all these great programs, pilot schools, charter schools. We know what works. And it's frankly not uh, all that complicated uh, when you can get away the barriers to moving ahead. If we have the will to say that all children should have early education, that we should look at a structured day, a longer day, so the kids can not only do well um, in their critical skills and thinking, but also in the arts, in moving more and getting more physical activity. That we look at what kids' own issues are, so that we have services at the school, if there are social services or physical or mental health issues that the child needs. And that we look at what our kids want to do. Every child who wants to go to college should, but if they're more interested in vocational technical or a two-year program, we should be looking at the great network we have in Massachusetts of not-for-profit schools, of state schools, and make that a seamless web for all of our kids. Until and unless we do that, we're not going to stop those cycles of poverty. I think that people say, well, how do we pay for it? I say, we need to do it. We will find a way to invest in it. And I think there are a lot of parents around this state who say, and I hope they will say it, that this has got to be a priority for us, and we will put our money where our mouth is finally when it comes to education. It's too important not to do it. We know what happens when we don't. And frankly, we can do this here in Massachusetts. I have no doubt that we could do it with the will 
and the resources to make it happen for uh, education. So that, that's a top priority for me. Segue, use that as a segue for another question that we have about revenue um, and how we find money for the programs that we all care about. Um, so as you know, the governor, our current governor, proposed what he and many in this room viewed as a, a progressive change to the tax code of the Commonwealth, reducing regressive sales tax, uh, ignoring the regressive gas tax, and focusing on changes to the income tax. Um, they would have added $2 billion in revenue to our budget. Um, so we just are curious uh, if you have any preferences or thoughts about how you would view and work with the tax code if you became governor. Well, I think that what we want to look at the whole picture is what, what are our revenues as the economy turns around? What are our revenues now from making sure that we keep homes on the tax rolls, we keep foreclosures down? What are the revenues that we save when we close loopholes on waste, fraud, and abuse? And what are the things that we want to do? Instead of the question saying, well, we'd like to do early education, but how will we pay for it? My approach is to say, we need to do early education. We need to make infrastructure. And then we need to say, how are we going to pay for it? Um, and without getting into specifics, I would say um, it's really important to look at how we pay for those without putting or increasing the burden on people who can afford it the, the least. Um, you know, we expected a lot of income, for instance, from casinos. Whether that happens or not, we don't know. And uh, it's, it's, the world has changed from two years ago. But I think a governor uh, and the cabinet and the legislature have to be understanding all in real time where, that, uh, where the revenues are coming from, what we're focused on. And I think we have to look broadly at where some of those sources of uh, funds can come from. We talked today, for instance, about the opportunity for corporate America to work with schools to provide for, in the short run, the kinds of things that schools themselves don't finance. We have, I think, and have historically had some good corporate citizens here in Massachusetts, and particularly in Boston. We've lost some of that. I say bring that back, that everybody is at the table in terms of these investments we make. You know, I think you know, we'll see, uh, even at the beginning of next quarter or in June, it'll be easier to see what are the projected incomes, what do these revenues look like. And I don't pretend to know the ins and outs of the budget. But I do know the tax policies and changes we make have to be uh, borne by those who can bear them uh, the most easily, and they should not be greater burdens on people who cannot. Sir, go ahead. Attorney General, this is a hard question for me to ask you because uh, uh, I like what you've had to say tonight, but uh, I was uh, disappointed and angry in the campaign about the campaign that you ran for the Senate. I've been very admiring of how you picked yourself up and went back to work. But then comes the story about the management of your campaign finance funds. And uh, it suggests a lack of attention to detail and not bearing down that I sort of saw in your, in your Senate campaign. So how do you... I'm sure I'm not alone in having these questions. How do you speak to people about, to, uh, like me, about those kinds of issues? Sure, no, and I'm glad that you've asked that because um, I think it's incredibly important for any elected official or candidate, particularly me, uh, to make sure that we are candid uh, and transparent about it. Um, as you have made reference to, obviously, uh, we made some mistakes in that Senate race, and, and it was a tough race to lose. I know that. Uh, I know Massachusetts knows that. Uh, and, and certainly in those issues that have now come to light, what I will say is this. The minute we learned about them, and it was just recently, uh, we began a conversation with the FEC. Uh, we are uh, paying attention to it so we will get it right. We will be, when that is finished, very transparent about what did or did not happen. Um, I think all of the reporting uh, has not necessarily been accurate, but I will let people know exactly what happened. We made mistakes. Uh, I acknowledge that. I own that. Uh, and I intend to make it right. And we mil will make it right. And I'll be very public about that. But uh, it's a fair question. It's a fair question to ask every candidate and every elected official uh, about that. I am very proud, though, in my work as Attorney General, um, and I do pay attention to taxpayer dollars and where they go. And we bring back 10 to the Commonwealth for every one I get. We've made a real focus on making sure that on the waste, fraud, and abuse that we see sometimes, whether it's with outside contractors or others, 
Um, we Medicaid fraud, we have an, a stellar record on that. So I appreciate your question. I'm glad that you asked it, frankly, and I uh, commend to all of you, you know, we, we do make mistakes. Uh, we did in this. We're going to fix them. We'll make it right, and we'll be clear about what we did. Okay. Well, keep in mind most of the complaints come from the FEC or the issues around a Senate federal race. So I, I guess I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said. The regulation of those is done by the Federal Election Commission. So we will straighten that out with them as we are doing. We will make clear what we have done. That would not be something that the Attorney General uh, does anyway. Uh, and I can only say that as we are working on it, take it incredibly seriously and we'll let everybody know what happened, what didn't happen, but we will make it right and it will be transparent that it will be right. As someone from North Adams, you know the power of the creative economy in Massachusetts. Yes. From Mass MoCA to the galleries and the other activities in North Adams. Yes. As governor of Massachusetts, how would you strengthen and utilize the creative economy? Um, I'm glad you asked that, and this is the first time someone's asked me that question. Uh, I actually have a sister who lives on Martha's Vineyard who is the executive director of the Chamber Music Society down there, and she and her husband are quite excited about, for that region, as North Adams and Berkshire County and many places in Boston, uh, we have a huge opportunity, I think, uh, with the people we have in this state, the people who want to live here, and the opportunity to turn that into uh, a real driver of the economy. I think that it has been underused here. Uh, I think that at a time when more people are interested in quality of life and what Massachusetts has to offer, it's a perfect time to look at investments, you know, again, in schools. If our kids don't learn art and music because they don't have time, they are not going to be interested or able to be musicians or patronize the arts. And as someone who has always loved that growing up and, and taken advantage of it, uh, we need to start with our kids, but I think we also need to look at ways the state can help provide for ways in which, particularly in certain regions, um, artists, musicians, uh, that which can be a very important part of uh, our own economy here and people coming to visit. Uh, it can be a huge uh, success. Again, you know, the, my fellow AGs always get annoyed about how I always say Massachusetts is the first in healthcare, we're the first to challenge DOMA, so we brag a little bit here. But we've, we've got the makings of an incredible, I think, creative economy. And there are parts of it around the state, but I think we could do better um, working with those regions about, you know, what, what do you need? I mean, part of what I always believe is if I want to learn how to do education better, I'm going to go to teachers and parents. Uh, I'm going to go to folks who are interested in this and say, what is it that we can do to help or to get out of the way in terms of regulations, other financial incentives, looking for federal grant money, making sure that the information, the technology you can use to get out what great stuff is going on in this state. But that is another piece of the exciting uh, uh, change in Massachusetts, that we have that opportunity. So thank you for that question. So we have a question in the back. Fred Cutter. Thank you very much. My name is Marcia, Attorney General. Thank you very much for coming to the complaint. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm a JP resident. I'm also the commissioner of the Department of Mental Health. And I want to thank you, Attorney General, for all the work that you've done on behalf of people with behavioral health issues, mental health issues, and substance abuse issues in the Commonwealth. Uh, and also to thank you uh, for your work on parity. Uh, parity Point. and commercial insurance for medical issues and behavioral health issues is paramount. And I wanted to ask you, Attorney General, um, how you would see the governor's, Governor Patrick's health care cost containment bill and the Accountable Care Act really working to reduce health care disparities across the Commonwealth, which will in turn um, increase performance in schools and the Commonwealth's economy? Well, certainly getting everybody covered, uh, and, and including the parity for mental and behavioral health issues, is the big first step. Uh, it also means, though, that you have to implement it fairly, uh, and they're often devils in the details, making sure that it works. 
Um, in, in terms of the healthcare disparities, and we know that from uh, the reports we do from uh, our charities division, and uh, we know that many of our not-for-profits make great efforts to provide for some uh, uh, services that would help to uh, change that healthcare disparity, but we know what some of the statistics are, and I do think the state has the obligation uh, through the Department of Health and the great work they do through your division uh, through working with our partners in not-for-profits around the state to make sure that we give, we implement the idea that we have access, health care for all, good quality health care. Um, we're not there yet, there's no question about it, uh, given certain populations and geography. There are a lot of changes in the health care market right now. Is There's consolidations and mergers and we're trying to keep costs down, which seems at odds with providing more care to people. One of the things I think that we've talked about is looking at you know more primary care and better ways to provide global coverage uh, and risk so that people are getting the care they need but not more than they need or less than they need not easy to do um, but we should be focusing on how those health care dollars are being used um, by doctors by greater use of nurses and health care aides and professionals to make sure people are getting um, the help they need both physical and mental health I mean, we are, again, the state that is best poised to do that. And I will say this, and it is unique in Massachusetts, I think, that we, we, I fight with the hospitals all the time, but I pick up the phone and talk to the head of partners, or I talk to um, the head of steward, uh, I talk to the health care plans, and the, we will talk to the businesses here about what's working and what isn't. And it's the one reason why health care has been a success in Massachusetts, where it has not necessarily in other states, and I think with some of the issues we see with implementation at the federal level, it's not easy stuff, and there's a lot of moving parts. Um, but I have learned through my time as attorney general, and I believe as governor, that we can continue doing that here. Uh, and we can once again lead the country in providing for good health care, good mental health care. I do want to add, sorry, that, that part of this is ridiculous, frankly, very terribly Yes, of course. And And so will you come on the stump with me because <laughs> you do it very well. I believe that, by the way. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, I, uh, this is a progressive uh, uh, meeting. Now, the opposite of progressive is regressive. I think our gambling system, our lottery system, and stuff is, is about the most regressive system we could possibly have. All over the city, right now, there are a lot of people with hardly any money whatsoever putting up money so people like me can pay less taxes. So the whole idea is it's, it's a drain. It's, it's a transfer of, of, of wealth from people who don't have any wealth to people who do. What is your... Um, Position on this, and what do you think that position could be in a debate with the current treasurer of this, uh, of this commonwealth? So, are you referring to the casino legislation or to the lottery? Well, I happen to hate the lottery system, but I'll, I'll be happy to hear anyone. Whatever <laughs> I actually bought a lottery ticket once. I didn't win. I said, I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> um, so, um, I understand and don't disagree with your premise. Um, I must admit I haven't focused but I, a, a lot on that particular issue on the lottery. Um, you know, mayors love it, cities and towns get aid from it, but there is this question of where is the money coming from and are we chopping it off one end and putting it here with the damage that we have it's in like between. It's your arm in terms of our, you know, taking wealth that we don't have and just trailing in the wrong directions to people who don't have it, which we have to then pay them more. So you're not actually benefiting from it. You have to take a look at what actually happens. So what, what are we going to do about it? 
What's what's happening here? Are we turning a corner with Milford and, and East Boston sort of uh, rising up and giving their two cents? Well, I think they are two separate issues, but I certainly see. Uh, in some ways, this statute working the way it should have. That is, you've got a tough gaming commission that's doing their due diligence, and you've got the statute that says, okay, you all want it, but everybody has local control. And so communities are, by and large, saying, well, it sounded like a good idea, but maybe not in my backyard. So in that respect, including the idea that this may be on the ballot question next year, because the courts will decide that, and people aren't getting signatures for it, um, there's some chance that democracy and people will say, you know what, no matter what we said or what we thought we said, we don't want this. Um, and that's where the progressive and the education of everybody comes in. Your position would be? Well, my position right now is that, you know, the legislature passed it. I, I made a big effort as uh, uh, the attorney general saying, talking to my colleagues who did have gaming, uh, gambling. If, you, if you're in favor of it, you call it gaming. If you don't like it, you call it gambling, right? I don't know if you pick that up. And so um, the Attorney General of Nevada, the Attorney General of New Jersey, um, you know, her office in New Jersey has 500 enforcement officers just around the gaming issue. And I think we've also seen it's not necessarily the economic driver that even people thought it might have been. So my position is to been, if you're going to do it public, if the public wants it, we should do it right. We should have enforcement. We should mitigate the damage. We should make sure that we maximize the economic benefit that you all say we will get with gaming uh, or gambling here. Now, since that time, you see what's happened, right? When people have had to vote on whether they actually want it, that's come out differently. It's not, democracy is never easy or clear or inexpensive in some ways, but in some ways this has worked in some, the, maybe the way it should have. And isn't it better for people to actually come to realize that maybe you're right about this in terms of the casino gaming? Uh, and, uh, but this is, this is the debate we have. It is not the first place I would have gone for economic development. Um, I am happy to, um, you know, abide by what a legislature does, um, but I also think uh, that it is time to look at other ways with the creative economy, uh, with starting smaller businesses, with not just innovation economy, but some of the more traditional businesses we have here that are taking advantage of new technology. But we've got, you know, we've got to get the kids who can do those jobs too. So if we can focus on that and people think we don't need gaming, then maybe next year on that ballot question, um, you see a different decision. Uh, so do two, maybe three more questions. The Attorney General, green technology, how do we wean ourselves from oil? How do we become the state we want to become using solar energy, using uh, wind energy? What, what's the governor's role in pushing that envelope? Because climate change is, is the biggest thing facing the world. Sure, and we, we talked about that. And, and the other side of it is, well, I think that Massachusetts, with the Green Communities Act and the, and the second version of it, uh, have done a great job of saying we're going to provide incentives for cutting our uh, dependence on oil. What's happened recently in the markets is, and nobody had predicted this, that as the cost of gas has gone down so much, you know, the markets have changed a little bit. And it's both a heavily regulated market, but a not very transparent market, not unlike our health care in some ways. Uh, I don't know about you, but when you get those utility bills, it's hard to figure out what is what. Um, so we've focused on the ratepayer piece, but also on making sure we implement sustainable, clean energy. Um, we helped a company out in the central part of the state cut through some red tape with the federal government and the state government so that they didn't have to close. They cut their uh, dependence on uh, oil by 40% and their cost by 40%, actually. So we've started down a path, but I think we have to do exactly what we've done with health care uh, and with other areas, which is you need the environmentalists, you need the businesses, and you need uh, the energy people at the table to say, what is it that we are going to be able to do to keep moving on the path, to cut this back, to make sure that we create sustainable uh, alternative energy that we can afford. Uh, and I think, again, we can do it. I think that we've got the brains here, we've got the firepower to do it, but it does take will from the governor as I would intend to do to make sure that we continue doing that. I think you can tie to your education thing. 
of course. I think the high schools and the colleges can be training people for these careers. Well, exactly. So you're on the stump too. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a JFU resident, small business owner, and I'm also a member of Veterans for Peace. Um, we're an organization that obviously has a specific agenda, but we are broad and progressive in what we uh, do. And among those, uh, while we do a lot of marches, one of the more important ones we do is to try to be involved in the St. Patrick's Day Parade, um, which we've been excluded from past few years by the Allied War Veterans Council because they don't like the fact that we have peace in our name, and they have historically excluded LGBT groups and whatnot for the past 20 years. We've been putting on our own St. Patrick's Peace Parade for the past three years, and we're planning to do one this coming year if we can't convince them to include us in the main parade. Um, so my question would be, to you would be, if Despite our best efforts, to be included in the main parade, if we have to, we will run our own parade against us, which, which the police who, who, who can take care of it say is better than the main one. <laughs> More exciting. Uh, would you march with us? Of course, I'm there. I'm happy to be there. We have Marty Walter on record as saying he's going to be with us, too. <laughs> and he said, I'm going to do away with this division. Oh, so interesting. Well, if Martin can do that, good for him. But I think the days of that parade, I hope, are numbered. And good for you for taking on this cause, because it is important uh, to be visible and vocal about it. So yeah, we bring in everybody. Yeah. Not just us, LGBT, all the environmental groups, peace groups, everybody else. We have a great cause. It's a good message. It's a lot of fun. And by the way, we are, as Veterans of Peace, to raise money to support this effort. We have a fundraiser coming up at Johnny D's on December 4th, where we have some bands and uh, dancing. I see where this is going now. <laughs> okay. Will you show up? Will I show up? And will I dance? Will dance? We will put it on our calendar and we'll see what we can do. Dancing shoes. Okay. All right, we're going to ask a housing question now. <laughs> Sandy, <laughs> from, uh, probably the final question. Um, there are over 4,000 families, including 8,000 children, who are currently homeless in the Commonwealth. More than 2,000 of these families, 562 here in Boston, who are living in motels at the cost of $100 a night, often away from their jobs, their schools, their communities. And it is common for motels to be rodent infested, bed bug infested. As governor, what steps would you take to reduce the use of motels and to ensure an adequate supply of permanent, affordable housing for our families? Well, and that is a good question, and it is actually, um, it's pretty sad that that number is what it is, and the number of homeless children particularly, but for anybody, homeless veterans. Uh, there's a huge number of homeless veterans in Massachusetts and the country. Uh, I think it's a disgrace in a country with the resources that we have that men and women who have served our country uh, find themselves without a job, without a home. Uh, and we do uh, some work, and we have the best record in the country for it, but it's not good enough. And so this issue of the short-term fix with hotels is not satisfactory to me. Um, I know that uh, we probably spend more money doing that in the short run than if we took it to say, uh, as I believe we need to do, uh, we need to solve this problem. We're not going to do it once and for all, but we need a much uh, a more stable and, and with a bigger heart solution to these particular families. I mean, it does tie into the issue we talked about tonight. Um, it, it people, a lot of people aren't that far from um, losing a job, having a medical bill, losing their home, and being on the street. So as we start to turn the economy around, we keep people in their homes when we can, We've tried to work in our cities and towns to bring some of those homes back. In some instances, um, not-for-profits buy them and make them available. Uh, but they're still, for a variety of reasons, people who find themselves <coughs> in hotels. Uh, I don't have a specific answer. I know we need to find one, and we will. Uh, it's not acceptable for, and it's not even cost-effective 
uh, for families to be living that way. And I thought that we had resolved that problem, or we had at least committed to resolving it, and we have not. So the, the issue of the homeless uh, is one, you know, that we have cabinet secretaries. We work with cities and towns on that. But it's something that I think people in Massachusetts have to come first. Uh, and that's where our resources should be put. Thank you. Um, we appreciate you being here. If there's a few words, minutes, however much time you have to say a few closing remarks. Sure. I'll be quick. I hope you all have a very nice Thanksgiving. <laughs> if you want to find out more, uh, we have a website. We're just getting organized. We're a little bit late to the game. Uh, I am really excited about this race. I think Massachusetts has great opportunities ahead. I need your ideas. I need your help. I'd love your vote. Come on board. Thank you.